Hello, I'm Paul Beck with University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, and this is a continuation of previous videos, and I'm talking about the um, permafrost, the terrestrial permafrost up in the Arctic region. So you can see surrounding the entire Arctic Ocean, there's continuous permafrost as furthest north, and then sporadic as you go further south, discontinuous or discontinuous as you go further south and then sporadic as you go even further south and isolated patches and the arctic is a region that's warming faster than any other part of on any other region on the planet and it will thaw the term permafrost releasing co2 and methane so this is part of the process this this uh, cartoon shows how we have it, with the permafrost intact, we can have a neutral carbon balance, some coming in, some going out with plant respiration, for example. As we get warming and starting to thaw, the plants are growing faster and there can be some more, more respiration of older carbon. As we get even warmer, there's a lot, of more, there's a lot more carbon out than in. We get capture of carbon with the vegetation, but we get a lot more coming out of the permafrost, the thawing permafrost, um, as indicated by the larger red, red arrow. So that's on, in, on terrestrial. Under the ocean, we have the permafrost extends down and we have hydrates, which is a latest of crystalline water, if you like, ice surrounding methane. And when the ice cage thaws out, the methane is released there's an expansion of about 160, 108, 160 plus times. It builds up the pressure underneath and then it bubbles up and comes up through the water column. If the water is shallow, then the water column is quickly saturated with methane and then the rest of it will get up into the atmosphere. So if the water column is very deep and there's small trickles coming out, it'll be absorbed completely in the water column, not reach the atmosphere. But if there's a burst, it'll quickly rise up and go into the atmosphere very quickly. So this just shows methane. This is just over six years, same time each year, same time um, it's uh, the 12th month, so December each year. And what you can see is, you can see the, the red is the methane. Um, the, the, this is a concentration, the color map, and you can see uh, a huge uptick of methane. This is in 2011 compared to previous years. Since 2011, here's another view, uh, different time of year. You can also see a very large increase of, of methane. Um, over five years, showing a large increase near the sea ice. And it's harder to get more recent data like this. this so the Arctic warming is changing the jet streams. Like I said, this is a more typical um, jet stream configuration. The jet stream is basically the white area in between the, the other two colors. So you can see it's mostly uh, circle, circumventing the North Pole, whereas here it's much wavier. There's, much, there's very deep troughs going deep south, and there's ridges going up fairly high north. So we're, and we're seeing this. Um, this type of configuration. This is 500 millibar geopotential height, so, but you know, it indicates temperature, basically, colder areas and warmer areas. So, looking, so you can see there is a huge difference. The jet stream is slowing down, becoming much wavier, and, uh, and causing problems. So here's a side view of an exceptionally wavy uh, jet stream. And this is a one, uh, the jet stream hooks back and comes around. And it was like this for many days. In June of 2013, there was tremendous torrential rains. It flooded out downtown Calgary and insured costs exceeded six billion. So you can look at all of these extreme weather events and you can relate them to what the jet stream is doing for the most part. This is a deadly heat wave that killed 70,000 people plus um, in a matter of weeks to a month in Europe. Many, most of these deaths were in France this is the heat wave here, which was persistent over lots of Europe, and people just weren't prepared for it. So the root cause was a wavy jet stream, or wavy and stuck, persistent ridge. 
So there's very real implications of everything I talk about here, and they're going to explode. They're going to get a lot, a lot worse. So this is a drought. Um, this is an indication of projected drought over the planet um, in about 40, 40, 50 years. And you can see these areas are becoming much drier. So the purples, these areas, the purples, the oranges, the only color places that are getting wetter are the greens to the blues. So the high northern region, we're getting wetter as the temperature is rising. There's less snow, there's more water, but these of many regions are undergoing severe drying of stress. So now we can match this. So get an idea where the drought regions are and now have a look at where we grow food and you can get the picture. So this is water stress in many agricultural areas by 2025 will increase. So any of the reds are bad. There's a lot more water stress in those regions. This is the effects on crop yields of uh, of, of warmer temperatures. So as the temperature goes up, then the, the down here in the reds, we have a 50% drop in yield in the dark reds and neutral as we go into brown. So the darker the reds, the more drop in yield, projected yields of many crops. This is the balance of regions that are used for agriculture. And this is the major cereals the attainable yields that are achieved now. So productive areas being green and less so being red. So if you match all of these images to where the droughts are, then you can see, you know, we're in for a world of hurt the way we're going. And we're gonna end up where we're going if we don't change things. The other major stress, the elephant in the room is the global population is out of control. You know, around 1,800, 1 billion, doubled in 123 years, and then added another billion in 33 um, years, added another billion in 14 years, and the gap's getting smaller and smaller. So we're at 7.5 billion, and we're projected to go to much higher. We, the mega cities of the world, this compares what they were in 2014 to what we expect them to be in 2030. So not much change for Tokyo, 35 uh, million. And then we go to a look at the growth in Delhi, in Shanghai, Mumbai, Beijing, Dhaka. Now what cities are going to be affected by sea level rise, global sea level rise? Well, we've got... Uh, We've got lots of these, Beijing, uh, Mumbai, Shanghai, like most of these cities are, a lot of these cities are on coastlines. So planet Earth, seven and a half billion and counting. With regard to be fruitful and multiply, cancel that order. Like we've got to, we can't just ignore climate change. You know, how are we gonna solve these global problems if we don't address uh, population, global population? You know, you are here. This is just from, this is from 2004. So this is from just over a decade ago and here was 6 billion. So you are actually here right now, seven and a half billion. You may not want to be here. You know, if we can't feed all the people and solve our global problems now, then we have to, we have to chop this ourselves in humane ways, well thought out ways, or we're gonna go up here and it's gonna, we're gonna collapse. And there'll be, you know, how is it ethical to keep growing, um, to keep having an extra 240,000 people? Every morning when you wake up and have breakfast, think about how many more people are on the earth, births minus deaths. And that number is about 240,000 every single day, about a 1.4% uh, growth rate, compounded exponential growth. You know, the numbers just don't add up for us. We, we're, our environment is collapsing. Our population is spiraling. You don't, if somebody is living on another planet looking at us, they're saying, you know what? If we want to do something, if we, we, we can wait, you know, decades, you know, and uh, the, the planet is going to implode and collapse. And, you know, then we'll go there and we'll just, you know, see if there's anything left. I mean, basically we're, 
you know, individually we're intelligent, but collectively we're we're as thick as thick as uh, we're 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 just doing the the worst things. It's like, how do we want to destroy the planet? How do we want to destroy our future? Okay, let's go do it, right? We're doing it. So we have to change our our complete economic. You, you know, there's all kinds of solutions. So what are some of the solutions anyway? Um, procrastination. Drivers of serious government action. Bad things must happen to regular people in rich countries now. The media must report them. This is very important. These bad things are happening, but the media is still not reporting them, the mainstream media properly, as being a result of climate change. Requires a change in worldview. So here's where we're going. Ice-free Arctic this decade. Extremely rapid um, ice-free in September. Very rapid warming, methane surges. Um, mega drought hitting U.S. Southwest, more Katrina-like superstorms, heat waves hitting U.S. breadbasket, food prices spiking, collapse, accelerating sea level rise, ice shelf collapse, Amazon rainforest collapse. How how can we deal with this? We have to we have to treat this as an emergency now. And this is a commodity index. World War One spikes, two spikes, inflationary oil spikes. This is the Arab Spring basically. Food prices spike. Uh, Russia stopped exporting grains because of the massive drought there. They, 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 like forty percent of uh, their their grain uh, production was forty percent down. So you know, owing to past neglect in the face of plaintiff's warnings, we have a period of danger. No more procrastination, half measures, soothing and baffling expedients of delays. We have a period of consequences. We can't avoid this period. We're in it now. Churchill just before World War World War Two. This is what we have to do to survive climate change. Three-legged bar stool on an emergency basis. So step one, general public, policymakers, governments, military scientists, everybody on the planet, we must get with the program and recognize our climate change emergency. Governments must declare a global climate change emergency. Then we deploy the three-legged bar stool type technologies to have a decent chance to survive the wrenching changes that we cannot avoid that are already in the pipeline. Leg one, we have to slash fossil fuel emissions to zero. No more fossil fuel subsidies, carbon taxes. How can we put carbon taxes on and keep subsidies in place? It's like, duh. Leg two, deploy carbon dioxide removal technology to lower the atmospheric concentrations. We have no choice. We have to do this. The ocean. We're going to lose uh, life in the oceans and we can't live without them. And uh, the levels are just too high. We have to bring them down to 350 or below. Leg three, we need to deploy solar radiation management, SRM technologies to cool the Arctic. Otherwise, Greenland's going to, going to uh, big chunks are going to break off Greenland and sea level rise will rise abruptly. And the whole Arctic will become without snow and uh, sea ice and the entire uh, jet stream configuration on the planet will reorganize and we'll have to relearn how to grow food again and life will become extremely miserable. So we have that choice. We, as, as, as quickly as we deploy these three-legged bar stool ideas, the better our chances of surviving on this planet. So thank you. And uh, please, please send this video far and wide. Get as many, you know, we, we've got to get, we've got to educate people. A lot of people that watch this video probably get it. You know, that's why they're watching the video. I mean, that's not good enough. We have to figure out how to widely disseminate this information in a world where it looks like we're heading uh, the wrong direction, at least in in the US. Our political systems are, you know, we can build up policies on climate, um, on tax, on carbon, and all the rest, and you know, we can implement them, and then a new government can come along and for, you know, after four years, so we just, when we finally figure it out how to do it properly, then the new government signs a couple forms on the first day, and we're done. I have this uh, recurring uh, vision of when Trump's first day in office, taking the Paris Agreement and uh, lighting it on fire. I mean, how can we have, how can we let one guy trash the planet like this? I think a condition of him being accepted by the electors is, and the military, et cetera, is he has to recognize climate change. Thank you.